two speakers for this event. Uh, first would be uh, Dr. Leon Sugars. He's Associate Professor of Biochemistry and Senior Sci Scientist at the Department of Biochemistry at uh, the Cardiovascular Research Institute of University of Maastricht. Dr. Sugar's research line involves the elucidation of molecular mechanisms of vascular smooth muscle cell-derived vitamin K-dependent proteins by which vascular calcification is initiated and propagated. Our second speaker will be Dr. Katarja Merez. She is the president of the International Science and Health Foundation, obtained a degree at the Faculty of Pharmacy um, at the I'm telling you, all of these words are just throwing me this morning, at uh, Jagellonen University and has a doctorate in biological sciences. She served as postdoctoral fellow in the Laboratory of Cellular and Molecular Immuno Immunolo Immunology, there you go, Blood Research Institute, Milwaukee, uh, and um, has been part of a research project co-funded by the European Union. Uh, Dr. Schurger, so I'll turn things over to you. Good Can you hear me? Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be invited uh, to speak here at the Vitamin K2 workshop. And actually, it feels like being a, a little bit a rock star. You know, it, uh, I'm, I'm from the scientific field, and normally you speak at scientific meetings. But being here and in the field of Vitamin K, it feels really like a rock star. And I saw Robbie Williams doing this. He's making pictures, you know, when he's giving a concert of his audience, so I want to do that as well. I never had this opportunity. So all smile, hey. <laughs> okay, but we are not here to, uh, to play rock stars. I'm here to, uh, to educate you a little bit of, uh, on vitamin K. So I entitled my presentation MK7 as a novel treatment option for cardiovascular disease. And I want to try to convince you in the next 30, 35 minutes why I think that vitamin K2 might be a really treatment option for cardiovascular disease. Well, when I started my research in the university, that's back 20 years ago, calcification was not really on the radar. You know, calcification was just a passive bystander and cardiologist, internal medicine, nephrologist, they were just aware of the calcification, but they didn't do anything with it because it was just the precipitation of calcium and phosphate salts on, let's say, cellular debris, and it was not really of interest. However, together with a PhD student of mine, who is now uh, working as an internal medicine doctor in the Maastricht University, we did a meta-analysis, and we screened for calcification at any vascular site in our human body. And actually what you can see is that all studies which we, which we screened, they show that if you have calcification, you have a risk on any cardiovascular event. So dying from a cardiovascular event, higher chance if you have calcification wherever, carotid artery, coronary arteries, um, uh, aorta, but also peripheral arteries. And the odds ratio is 3.4. So you have a 3.4 higher chance of dying if you have calcification in your arteries. Actually, this was uh, becoming really uh, aware now in the medical society. And it's not only in our uh, laboratory in Maastricht, but also here in the United States, Paul Ruggi, he is a famous cardiologist screening uh, calcification in, in, in coronary arteries, and he says that the coronary artery calcification score is a better predictor for cardiovascular events than the complete Framingham risk score, which includes age, gender, uh, smoking, cholesterol, hypertension. So calcification really is now on the radar, and it is used as a, as a measurement for cardiovascular disease uh, all the time. So actually what we are looking for is calcification, and this is just a picture of how your washing machine looks like if, if calcification takes place. But also in our human body we have um, um, diseases where calcification really takes place. We have hypercalcemia, this is uh, calcium levels in the circulation higher than 2.8 millimolars, hyperphosphatemia higher than 2 millimolars, we have atherosclerosis, so locally in the vessel wall we have calcium concentrations higher than 30 millimolars, which is really, really high, so normally we have 2.45 in our bloodstream. End stage renal disease where the calcium and phosphate product is increased and calcium phosphate, maybe you still know that from your chemistry lessons, they're not really going together, you know, they precipitate. So we need cellular systems, we need proteins to inhibit that precipitation. And then with hypertension, the intracellular calcium load is really high. 
So the precipitation of calcium salts happens at pathological sites, and mainly that is in the vasculature. So actually where we are looking for is the bleed. Can we inhibit, can we prevent calcification, or when calcification is there, can we reduce it or hold the progression of calcification? I have to tell you that calcification in bone is an active mineralization process, building bone but also resolving bone, and my belief is that the calcification in the vasculature is an active process, and so also the resorption of calcium from our arteries should be and must be an active process. So I did my PhD um, back in 2002 in Maastricht um, on vitamin K and the differential effects of vitamin K1 and K2. And actually I was the first one who discovered that vitamin K2 had other functions, better functions than K1. So it was not me that discovered vitamin K, it was a European guy from Denmark, Hendrik Dam, and what he did is he fed chickens a fat-free diet. And by doing so, all these chickens were bleeding to death. So he substituted cholesterol, it wasn't the cholesterol, he substituted all kinds of micronutrients, fat-soluble micronutrients, and suddenly he isolated one nutrient which prevented the bleeding disorder. And because he published this in a German journal, he called it the coagulation factor. And Coagulation in German is written with a K, and from that time on, vitamin K uh, is known as the coagulation vitamin, whereas I would uh, rather name it the calcification uh, protein. Up to now, we have 14 vitamin K-dependent proteins which are discovered. The most known are, of course, that, that uh, from, from the coagulation cascade, factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. And a clear function of vitamin K, besides also playing a role in the redox uh, cycle, is of course that it activates vitamin K-dependent proteins. I will come to that in a minute. And we have of course vitamin K1 and K2, which is found in green leafy vegetables or in fermented food. So what is the real function of vitamin K? Vitamin K is absorbed via the food. It's a vitamin, it's a vital amine, so we need it to take it via the food. And vitamin K is taken up by uh, the bloodstream in the, in the intestines, it's incorporated in um, um, chylomicrons, and then it's transported to the endoplasmic reticulum in cells where we need to carboxylate, activate vitamin K-dependent proteins. Okay, that animation works. Here it doesn't work. So vitamin K needs to be reduced to the reduced form of vitamin K, which is the active cofactor in the carboxylation reaction. Now, what does vitamin K do? When it is oxidized, it provides the energy to put in an extra carboxyl group in certain glutamic acid residues, protein-bound, Glutamate, uh, glutamic acid residues and carboxylates them. It gives them an extra negative charge and by this extra negative charge, it can bind calcium to, for example, phos negatively phospholipids or it can nucleate calcium and shield binding sites. So why is it that we need minute amounts of uh, vitamin K? We need only micrograms in the diet and not milligrams like, for example, vitamin E. That is because vitamin K is recycled, and in this way, one molecule of vitamin K can assure thousands of these carboxylation reactions. So one molecule of vitamin K ensures thousands of these carboxylation reactions. Nearly the same time that vitamin K was discovered in Europe, in Wisconsin, there was a substance that was discovered which uh, made that cows, which were dehorned, were bleeding to death. And although it was discovered in America, it was a German uh, pathologist uh, that discovered this, this disease. And he isolated one micronutrient, again, which was warfarin. And actually, warfarin stands for Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation with Aaron from Coumarin. Coumarins were first launched as rat poison. So actually, what we are doing in, in our clinic is treating our patients with rat poison. And that was because in 1951, there was a, a US soldier who wanted to commit suicide. And he took a lot of warfarin. But then he thought, well, shit, I, I want to live. And because the onset of warfarin is a few days, he could go to the hospital, and they could give him vitamin K to rescue his bleeding phenotype. And actually, by, by doing that, they, the medical doctors realized that we have a very strong anticoagulant. And that is where the red poison became a medical uh, substance. And actually, in 1955, Eisenhower was one of the first famous recipients of warfarin. So what does warfarin do? What is vitamin K antagonist? Do they inhibit the absorption of vitamin K? Well, no, they don't inhibit the absorption of vitamin K. Vitamin K is taken up by the intestines, it's transported in the blood, it's going to all the target tissues. And also, it does not inhibit the reduction of vitamin K becoming an active cofactor. So what does warfarin do? It actually doesn't even inhibit fully decarboxylation. But what it does, 
it inhibits the recycling. And in this way, giving vitamin K antagonist to a patient, you make sure that one molecule of vitamin K only creates one GLA residue instead of thousands. So you decrease the vitamin K levels in the tissues and thereby you, you, you increase vitamin K insufficiency. And this is what we want to do, of course, because uh, pa pa patients that have hypercoagulability, uh, you want to lower the blood clotting. But what was realized is that it not only affects the blood coagulation, it also affects other proteins, such as matrix GLA protein. And that is something what we realized. And I show, just show you here uh, one example. We used warfarin, vitamin K antagonist, in, in mice. And by doing so, we first wanted to know what is the optimal dose. So we gave different treatment regimens, different treatment regimens of vitamin K1 together with warfarin. And what we found is that you need at least 1.5 milligram vitamin K1 plus extra warfarin, and then you prevent the bleedings of the mice, because if you go lower with vitamin K, all the mice died due to severe bleedings. But what you create is a vitamin K, a severe vitamin K deficiency in the vasculature, thereby inducing calcification. So this is what we found, is if you use 1.5 milligram of vitamin K1, and on top of that you titrate extra warfarin, vitamin K antagonist, in the diet, the higher the dose of warfarin, the more calcification you find back in the vasculature. If you do it for a longer time, so over time, baseline versus seven days, 28 days, or 49 days of warfarin treatment together with vitamin K1 in these animals, then you see that the calcium load is already increased after seven days of warfarin feeding, whereas the first vid visible signs, and everything here in black, these is, our, is a von Kossa stain. It's a specific stain for calcium phosphate in the vasculature. And everything which is black is calcification. So you see that after 28 days, one month, you see already dramatic calcifications in, in the vasculature of these mice. This is medial calcification. But of course you want to ask me, okay, this is a red poison. Of course it does make calcification, creates calcification in the vasculature. This is not the human situation. So this is where we collaborated with Harvard University a few years ago, and this is a patient which um, um, developed severe end organ failure. So this patient had to go on dialysis, and he was placed on warfarin. And so what they did, medical doctors, they did a CT scan when he came into the hospital. And he was treated for nine months with Coumarin, and what you can see is that and unfortunately this patient died, but what you can see is here all these white spots. These are calcifications in all the large medial air, uh, medium uh, arteries of this patient. So if you ask me what is the onset of calcification in vitamin K deficiency in a patient, it can be as quick as nine months that you are calcified in all your arteries. Another example is calciphylaxis. Calciphylaxis is, a, is, a, is a, a, a deathly disease, mainly occurring in dialysis patients, but not limited to. And what these patients develop is complete calcification of the large arteries, which you see here, the small arteries, but also of the skin arteries. So this is completely calcified skin. And what is very interesting in this disease is, is that 50% of the patients receives warfarin. So in this calciphylaxis disease, dramatic calcification, 50% of the patients is on warfarin, has a very severe vitamin K deficiency. And finally, we also did a study with the cardiology department in our Maastricht University. This was published in the European Heart Journal, a very high-ranked medical journal. And what we did is we looked in atrial fibrillation patients, but with a very low risk on developing, on, on having that. And actually, the treatment for these patients is a very a little bit un, unsecure. You know, we don't know exactly what to do, but warfarin is safe. Vitamin K antagonist treatment is safe, so, so give it. So what we did is we used patients younger than 65 years or older than 65 years, which were either not on vitamin K antagonist for 6 to 60 months on vitamin K antagonist or longer than 60 months on vitamin K antagonist. And we stratified according to the framing M uh, risk score, so all patients had the same baseline risk score. And what you can see is that those patients which were not on vitamin K antagonist treatment had no calcification in their arteries, whereas those which were on vitamin K antagonist, they had 
a Gadsden score between 100 and 400, and Dr. Goodman already told us that that is a very high score. It's even more dramatic in the elderly population, where is here those patients not on vitamin K antagonists. The majority of them, 50%, had no calcification in their arteries, whereas those longer than 60 months on vitamin K antagonists, 50% of the patients had an Agatzen score over 400. Very indicative that vitamin K deficiency really induces calcification, also in humans. So what is causing this vitamin K deficiency? We, well, for a long time it was not known, but then it became clear that this protein, matrix lab protein, is a vitamin K dependent protein inhibiting vascular calcification. Well, the protein was discovered in bone and uh, 1980s, um, and everybody was thinking, okay, we have another bone protein in hand. So researchers here from, from New York, they created a so-called matrix GLA protein knockout mouse. So what you do is you take the DNA of the mouse, and then you take out the gene that encodes for this protein, you put back the DNA, and these, these, these mice are born normal, born to term, however, miss this protein. And actually, the researchers were looking for a bone phenotype. However, all mice were born normal, but all died within eight weeks after birth. And what happened when they gave these mice a closer examination, they saw that this, this is not the spine. Everything in red is calcium. This is the aorta. These are all the large vessels. So all large vessels were completely calcified if you lack this protein. And from that time on, everybody knows MGP is one of the strongest inhibitors of vascular calcification. So what we did, or I did during my postdoc uh, period, we created MGP antibodies. And with these MGP antibodies, we could really detect the inactive form or the active form of matrix cloud protein. And what you can clearly see here from this section, this is a human section of a peripheral artery. You see here the calcification spots along the elastic lamina. Everything in black is calcium again. And here, this is the inactive form of matrix cloud protein co-localizing with the calcification. Of course, you can, you can speculate that either calcification induces vitamin K deficiency leading to inactive MGP, or that the inactive MGP really makes that the vessels calcify. And I, I foster the, the latter um, hypothesis because with the vitamin K antagonist, we induce uncarboxylated MGP and thereby calcification. Everybody says that calcification is a very late stage of cardiovascular disease, and I disagree. And I disagree because we did a study together with uh, our Department of Physiology and together with the Technical University in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, where Philips, for example, is located, all known to you. And what we used is we used atherosclerotic plaques from patients, which we divided in a type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 lesion. Type 1 is, let's say, the healthy artery. Type 2 is a little bit of lipid infiltration. Type 3 is already inflammation. Type 4 is a little bit more advanced, and you, um, you, you, you get already a, a really um, stenotic uh, uh, lesion. However, calcification is always thought to be a very late stage, let's say, in type 5 plaques, where you, before it can rupture. But what we did is we, we did with a, a, a proton microprobe, which you can do element analysis on a micro scale. And what we found is that calcifications are already in the healthy vessel wall. And that is calcium phosphate in a ratio of hydroxyapatite. So you find the first calcification already in a type 1, more in type 2, 3, 4, and it nicely correlates with, with inactive MGP suggesting that the vitamin K deficiency leads to microcalcifications, and these microcalcifications are the start of all the cardiovascular events in later life. So we want to prevent these microcalcifications. We want to prevent calcifications in our vasculature. And actually, because vitamin K is so important, together with my colleague Martin Shearer from, uh, from King's College in, uh, in London, we wrote a book chapter. And we, uh, we started the chapter that uh, a vitamin once regarded as the Cinderella of fat-soluble vitamins emerged from a single function, hemostatic, so coagulation vitamin, to a multifunction function, uh, vitamin, and arguably the most fascinating of all, and that is vitamin K. So I started my presentation that you have two forms of vitamin K. You have vitamin K1 and you have vitamin K2. And actually, the, uh, the work I did during my PhD was that I asked volunteers to eat spinach together with natto. And natto is, of course, the fermented soybean, very rich in MK7. And we measured the amount of MK7 in 
the, the natto, and we measured vitamin K1 in the spinach, and that were equal amounts for breakfast. And it was very difficult to find these, uh, these volunteers to eat 200 grams of natto. So here, at baseline, patients or people, volunteers, had to eat 400 grams of spinach with 200 grams of natto, which equals one milligram of MK7, one milligram of K1. And what you can see is that K1 is very poorly absorbed, and that is what we already knew. 90% of the vitamin K1 from the food ends up in the toilet, only 10% is absorbed, whereas MK7 was absorbed very good. It is a 10 times better absorption from food than for, uh, for K1. But the second thing which you can see from this is that there was a complete buildup in the bloodstream. And this means that vitamin K1, K2, MK7, so the long chain menaquinones, they are taken up from the food, they are taken up by the liver, and then redistributed in the plasma and being available for all the extra hepatic tissues such as bone and vasculature. And this is really necessary because K1 is going to the liver and it makes that the coagulation factors are activated there, but there is only a little bit left over for all the extra hepatic tissues. So this is what we used. And this is a very busy slide, so I will try to, to guide you through it. We used mouse models. And these mouse models, they are uh, genetically modified so that when you give them a McDonald's diet, so a high cholesterol diet, they all develop atherosclerosis. And what we could see is that if you give warfarin to these mice, you get calcification, significant increase in calcification. So this we have now proven over a dozen times, and also other groups. And if you give them a low dose of vitamin K and you stop the warfarin, then you see that calcification, once it's present, it's the best predictor of calcium growth. So once calcium is there, it keeps on growing. However, when you give high dose of vitamin K2, you see that there is a reduction of 37%. So this is very speculative that vitamin K2 can reduce preformed arterial calcifications. This was published in the journal Blood in 2007. Recently, we collaborated with the university, clinical university in Aachen, Germany, and we showed that also in another mouse model, in a DBA2 mice, when you give vitamin K2 on top of the K1 and the warfarin, you could completely inhibit vascular calcification in the arteries of these mice, suggesting that vitamin K2 is really a good treatment option to inhibit, but also to regress preformed arterial calcifications. And a very recent study with MK7, which was published in the journal Nutrients one month ago, we showed again that high dose of MK7 could reduce calcification, and this is a mouse model, uh, sorry, a rat model um, for CKD, chronic kidney disease. So in these patients, these patients suffer from a lot of calcification. The treatment with MK7 could reduce the calcification, but more interestingly, it also increased the expression of MGP protein. So MK7 does more than only activating it, it also makes that there is more secretion, production of MK7. And this is the first study showing this. This slide has already, already been shown by, by Dr. Goodman, and I will briefly go over it. This goes back uh, 10 years ago, where we collaborated with the Erasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And they have a very nice population, which is called the Rotterdam study. And I did a lot of measurements of vitamin K in food, and we coupled our food analysis, our database, to their patient population. And these are all healthy elderly. They are followed up every year. And finally, nobody survives this study because they just follow up till everybody dies. And this is the first 10 years of follow-up. And we divided the vitamin K intake into third tiles. Vitamin K1 had no effect at all on cardiovascular disease. However, what we saw is that the highest third tile of vitamin K2 intake, mainly the long chain menaquinones, MK7, 8, and 9, had a 50% reduction of arterial calcification, had a 50% reduction of cardiovascular death, and a 25% reduction of all cause mortality, which is logic because 50% of all mortality is based on cardiovascular death. So this was a first study. It was very difficult to get this published because nobody believed it. It was too good to be true. Oh, sorry. And there was so another study in the Netherlands where we were not involved, 
And they showed that for every 10 micrograms of long chain melanquinones, MK7, 8, and 9, there was a decrease by 9% of cardiovascular risk. Indicative that vitamin K2 is really decreasing calcification and thereby preventing cardiovascular disease. A new study which we initiated together with the uh, uh, vascular, vascular uh, surgery department in, uh, in Aachen, Germany, is that dialysis patients, they have um, three times a week, they have dialysis. And for that, they, do the, they, they connect the dialysis machine via a, a vascular access, and that needs to be an artery. And this artery normally is very difficult to access, so what they do is they take a venous vessel and they connect that to the artery. And by doing so, you can then easily um, connect the, the dialysis um, machine to this venous artery. But there is a clinical problem. And this clinical problem that is there is 63% of these vascular access, they are not useful anymore after, after some time. So what people do, what does the clinic do? We give warfarin, vitamin K antagonist, to keep this vascular access open. So what we did is we developed a rat model in which we studied this um, phenomena. And briefly, what we saw is, and this study will be published in the Kidney International Journal next week, what we saw is that with warfarin, you made the disease worse. More calcification, more neointimal hyperplasia. So we switched, instead of warfarin, to vitamin K2, and what we saw is we could have a complete prevention of the calcification in this vascular excess and also prevention of neointimal hyperplasia. And actually, the medical doctors themselves, they concluded vitamin K2 should be regarded as a, as a thera uh, therapeutic approach to prevent neointimal hyperplasia and calcification in vascular excess. So I think we have some breakthroughs. So then the question, where do we get our vitamin K2 from? Well, of course, we can, we can eat natto. It's a very rich source. But what is natto? Natto is a fermented soybean. Actually, it's a rotten soybean. And how does it taste? It tastes like rotten soybean. So it's not a very nice thing to, to appreciate. At least in Japan, it's very appreciated. Outside Japan, not many people like it. What, what else can you do for vitamin K2? Well, go to the zoo and look what chimpanzees do. They eat their own feces. It's full of vitamin K2. We can do that. But, well, actually, nobody wants to do that. So thank God there are companies that now have supplements enriched with MK7, so we don't need to go to the toilet and eat our own feces, or we don't need to add natto, we can just take supplements. And what we did is we used these supplements for a dose-finding study, and this dose-finding study was published a few years ago, and we wanted to know what is the optimal dose. This is in young, healthy volunteers. And we saw that 180 micrograms of MK7 is optimal in carboxylating osteocalcin. So that was used for a three years clinical trial, and Dr. Goodman already briefly showed this, and I will go over it very briefly. 244 participants, main IQ7 versus placebo intervention study, three years with a daily sub supplement, 180 micrograms of MK7, main IQ7. Standalone, so no calcium, no vitamin D supplementation, and the endpoints were DEXA, so bone mineral density, vascular health, pulse wave velocity, intima media thickness, and the body weight. And the measurements were at baseline one year, two years, and three years. So what we saw is, is that the intima media thickness, and Dr. Goodman already explained it, it's a measure, it's a clinical measure for how healthy your arteries are. And what we could see is that main IQ7 could completely preserve the vascular health, whereas the placebo decreased in vascular health. So this study was the first study to show that vitamin K2, MK7, main IQ7 in this study, could prevent the loss of vascular elasticity. Actually, it made the vessels more elastic because it prevents calcification there. A second measurement is the pulse wave velocity. And with the pulse wave velocity, you measure the speed of a bolus blood from the, from the uh, carotid artery to the femoralis. And the quicker the traveling of the blood, the stiffer the vessels are. And actually what we saw is that MK7 reduced stiffness of these arteries. And MK7 was the first treatment option that you could reduce arterial stiffness. So this is in healthy volunteers. 
but also in patients, also the cardiology department, internal medicine, they are now very aware that MK7 could be a treatment option because clearly statins, they cannot inhibit calcification. And many, many drugs have been tested to reduce arterial calcification because it's really a hot topic at this moment. So this is a study sponsored by the Dutch Heart Foundation and by Nato Pharma. We have 200 patients to include 100 placebo, 100 on MK7, main Q7 for 360 micrograms for two years. At this moment, we have 120 patients enrolled because these are patients. These are screened in the cardiology department in our hospital. And they have an Agatzen score between 50 and um, uh, 400. And then they are treated with either placebo or MK7. And the endpoints, the primary outcome endpoint is the progression of coronary artery calcification. There is a second study which starts now. Actually, we have now medical ethical approval in which we want to study the effect of main Q7, 360 micrograms on aortic valve calcification because that is a huge clinical problem as well. This is also a study in which we also will include PET MRI, a new sodium fluor 18 PET probe, which measures uh, active mineralization. And this study is now uh, more or less up and running. So I think you will hear more and more about vitamin K2, MK7, in the upcoming years. The clinic is, is getting interested in it. The nephrologists are interested in it. And I think if we can prove that MK7 can reduce arterial calcification, that would be a really step forward in, 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 uh, in, in the medicine. So finally, I want to thank my sponsors because I need money to all conduct all my uh, research. And I want to uh, thank especially the Dutch Heart Foundation, but also Nato Pharma for providing and supporting me for over 10 years already. Thank you, and I'm more than happy to address questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sugars. Our, our go-to for the first question. You mentioned that uh, vitamin K recycles about a thousand times in the tissue. So uh, when we supplement, the tissue gets saturated. There's a cumulative effect. And I'm curious what, um, and I, I know some, some of the K7 converts to K4. And so what is the half-life of, of, of these vitamin uh, Ks? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very good question. They only checked it in the liver. And if you don't supplement and you put patients, this is a Japanese study from 1993, if you don't give vitamin K for three days, I think 80% of the vitamin K store is empty. Okay, so, we have a question at the back. Just, just to reinforce your studies on the mouse that you presented, um, Iowa State University out of Ames in the early 1970s did a primate study in which they found that primates died of atherosclerosis out of the clear blue sky and nobody understood why. And they found it was the lack of K1 in the monkey chow. And now K1 is standard in all uh, primate feeds uh, given to all research people or the monkeys die of yeah. heart disease. Is that, pu is that study published? Yes, sir. Okay. Excellent. It was probably before my time. Okay, coming up front for a question here. Thanks, Leon. Um, I was having a little discussion at the break and one of the points made by somebody was that we need a certain amount of undercarboxylated osteocalcin. So when you make a measurement, you don't actually wanna see a level where you have maybe more than 20 or less than 20 percent because you actually need the undercarboxylated to be ready to be activated. I wanted your comment that. And this, I'd like you to just comment on, do we need a multitude of vitamin K supplements when you take a supplement or will the effect of the MK7 be sufficient to do the job with regards to bone and heart health? So coming back to the first comment, as a biochemist, I don't believe in inactive proteins because our body puts in a lot of energy and effort to produce a protein. And then the last step, which is the post-transnational carboxylation, is not in place. I think it's, it would be a waste of energy. So I think we don't need undercarboxylated uh, proteins. There is some rumor in the literature that undercarboxylated osteocalcin is an active hormone in insulin uh, targeting. But this is actually inactive osteocalcin, which is resorbed from bone. So it's not because it's inactive due to vitamin K deficiency. It's 
activated carboxylated osteocalcin, which is resorbed under acidic conditions and thereby decarboxylated. So answering your first question, question I don't think we, we need any undercarboxylated uh, protein. Coming back to your second question, um, at this moment we are targeting vascular calcification, as it is, and that is where we use MK7. Um, in that respect, you can use it as a standalone, but if you ask my, my real opinion, I think that multivitamins or different targets is always better. For example, looking at the atherosclerotic plaque, you can target the cholesterol with a statin or with fish oil or with omega-3 uh, fatty acids. But on the other hand, you need to target the calcification. And putting these two together, maybe with magnesium, you have a better effect. So I would propagate that multiple combinations could have a bigger effect, so one plus one makes three instead of just one single nutrient, which of course does the trick on calcification. We have time for one more question, if we've got one. If not, Dr. Sugars, thank you very much. And you. Uh, Dr. Mores, I think we're ready for you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here and present this very important data about vitamin K2 and bone health. So, because uh, we had a very nice introduction of the mechanism of action by previous speaker, I won't go into details, but I would like to remind you only that vitamin K can go into a cycle in the body that's why we don't need a huge dosage for supplementation, and a microgram dosage is efficient to support healthy bones and healthy car cardiovascular system. Uh, what about the field of action? As previous speakers said, we've got a many of them, but the, uh, this which are the best study are homeostasis, bone health, and we've got a lot of clinical studies published recently which show that vitamin K2 is crucial for healthy cardiovascular system. So what kind of vitamins do we have? We've got a, it's a family of vitamin. We've got vitamin K1, and vitamin K1 cannot be synthesized by humans. Vitamin K1 is a origin from plant, and it's tightly bound to chloroplast. That's why it's very difficult to get vitamin K1 from your healthy green diet. It was shown, as Leon, Dr. Sugar said, that only 10 up to 20% of vitamin K2 from green vegetables is absorbed and can reach circulation. However, vitamin K2 is very, very well absorbed and can reach uh, extra hepatic tissues, so it can support other field of action than homeostasis can support bone and cardiovascular function. And what the source of vitamin K2? Vitamin K2 is synthesized by bacteria. It can be synthesized in our body and in, um, it, it can be found in some products. This slide was shown already, but I would like to remind you because it's very important in my opinion. I receive a lot of questions through vitamink2.org and people ask, they, they don't want to supplement, they are interested to change the diet habits. However, it's very easy in some cases, it's not so easy for vitamin K2. As you can see, the richest source of vitamin K is uh, vitamin K2 is fermented natto, so fermented soy. However, it's not popular in Europe as well as in the US. You can find some decent amount of vitamin K2 in cheese, but I will talk about it more on the next slide. Regarding K1, I showed before that the richest source, of course, are green veggies, like a spinach, for example, or broccoli, but we've got a problem with absorption. So regarding the cheese, Dr. Goodman said before that he is a cardiologist, won't be happy to patients to have a lot of cheese every single day, but I would like to point that we've got the different cheeses on the market, and probably the only good cheese can Dr. Sugar find in, in, in Maastricht, because this cheese, all traditional cheese, contain a lot of vitamin K2. Not a lot, but decent amount of vitamin K2. 
However, when samples from Godachis from US were tested in Vitak Institute, they found that there is zero vitamin K2 in this cheese. So if you are a mom and you are crazy about your healthy bones for your children and you give them cheese macaroni, you, you should know about it that you don't give them vitamin K2. So you don't support them healthy bone. So I told you about it that we've got a problem with the intake of vitamin K2 in a regular food, but what about the deficiency? How can we recognize that we are deficient and we need vitamin K? So everyone knows that if you have a problem with bleeding, so it's familiar for majority of people, and it's known for the doctors also, so it, that you don't have enough vitamin K. So people are supplemented with vitamin K1 in this case. However, we've got a second model. We've got a second situation, which is a called chronic deficiency. Otherwise, we can say sub-deficiency. So we don't bleed. Our coagulation system is perfectly fine. We feel OK. We don't feel any pain in the bones. Our arteries seems to be OK. However, our extra hepatic proteins, which are important for bones and important for cardiovascular system, are inactive. It means that they cannot act properly, and calcium cannot be removed from the arteries and put in the bones. In this stage, if it takes a long time, in this case of the subclinical deficiency, it will lead to osteoporosis and vascular calcification, as well as other age-related diseases. So if we look at this graph, it represents different intake using different diets. So very often, children are on a junk food. Even if mom takes care of them, they prefer to have hamburgers and a fast food. So you can see on this graph that they don't have at all vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. However, many people are crazy about a healthy living. They exercise a lot. They eat a lot of green stuff. And they think that they, they, they can help their bones to be healthy. And of course, they, they, the intake of vitamin K2 in this population is pretty high. But I told you before that we've got a problem with absorption. So even if the content of K1 is big in a salad, the level which the amount which reaches circulation is pretty low. The only uh, healthy people, not healthy people, but happy people uh, are in Japan because they eat natto every day, and the intake of vitamin K2 is pretty good in this population. So the major source of vitamin K uh, in Europe, and probably the same in the US, vitamin K1 is the major source of, of this. So one issue is the intake of vitamin K. It changes, depends on the diet. <clears throat> But it's nice to see if we, if we can check deficiency in the blood. And uh, we've got some commercial assays, which are not popular right now. But it's at the research state, uh, stage, and they are used in clinical trials. When scientists evaluate vitamin K-dependent proteins, which are inactive, and it represents vitamin K status. And uh, on this graph, you can see two of them, dephosphorylated and carboxylated MGP, which represents a very important cardiovascular marker, and undercarboxylated osteocalcin. And both of them are found up to 30% uh, in, in Western population. So it has been shown by the Maastricht group that people in Western Europe are deficient. Moreover, in 2011, it was published study that around 97 of the population is K deficient. The study enrolled more than 450 volunteers, and uh, the volunteers were evaluated for the amount of inactive MGP. And 97 percent of, of them had very high level of inactive MGP. So can we do something about it? Yes, we can do using a supplementation. And in this study, vitamin K1 was used for supplementation over three years. They used uh, 500 micrograms daily of philoquinone. And they found out that in this group, which was supplemented with vitamin K2, the level of inactive MGP dropped dramatically. 
So I was talking a lot about the healthy volunteers and healthy adults, but my talk should be focused on children. So what do we know about the children? So um, only two different studies were published on children when they found out that children have very, very high level of inactive osteocalcin, which is very important bone marker. If you look at this graph, you can see the first, uh, the first bar represents children below 10 years of age, and the second bar represents children between 10 and 19. The bars are huge in comparison to the smaller bars, which are for adults. So children showed in the study the largest specific uh, vitamin deficiency, and it means that children should benefit the most from vitamin K2 supplementation. So uh, because the previous talks were about uh, mainly cardiovascular system, I would like to say more about osteocalcin. I said before that we've got two forms. One is inactive and the second is active. But it's very important to remember that only active form can bind calcium and support healthy bones. And uh, this can be evaluated. So vitamin K2 is not the only vitamin which is necessary for healthy children's bones. Uh, we've got a second one, very important vitamin, and everyone knows about it. So it's vitamin D. Vitamin D is involved in bone mineral metabolism and bone growth. It can have many, many different functions. The most important are that vitamin D increase calcium absorption, and we need a calcium for healthy bones in children to grow stronger. Moreover, vitamin D stimulates synthesis of osteocalcin and promotes bone formation and mineralization. So we know that vitamin D is important. We need a second factor, which is calcium. And a lot of food in the US is fortified with calcium, actually. And Dr. Kudman told us today that it may be also dangerous for adults. But in the case of children, we know that calcium is not enough. Uh, the recent study evaluated the intake of calcium in developed countries, countries such as US, New, Zeal New Zealand, and others, and they found out that children have very high intake of calcium every single day. The intake may be even up to one milligram per day, one, uh, 1,000 milligram per day. However, the rate of fracture is still high in, in these countries. So if I would like to convince you that for a healthy bone, we need not only calcium, we need also vitamin D, and we need a vitamin 2, which can be a friend of both of them. So why it's like that? So active form of vitamin D uh, influences our intake from the intestine, increases intake of calcium from the intestine, so we've got in a blood. But we would like to put this calcium from the blood into bone to build healthy bones. Moreover, active form of vitamin D increases the synthesis of osteocalcin. So we've got this very, very important protein which is necessary for healthy bone. However, I, told you, I showed you on a previous slide that osteocalcin can be shown in two different forms, and we need active carboxylated form of osteocalcin. And in this case, we need vitamin K and the best vitamin K2 because it was shown that vitamin K2 is more efficient than vitamin K1 and MK7 seems to be the, the, best, um, the best solution for this. So when we've got osteocalcin which is carboxylated already, in this case calcium can bind to this and it can be bound to hydroxyapatite and to support healthy bones in children. So to have a right and good vitamin K status in children is very, very important because you need to build a strong bone when you are young, when you are a child. If you, can be, uh, if you can build your high, strong bone before you are 30, it means you've got the strong bones, you've got a lot of bone tissue to lose when you are old, and your risk of osteoporosis is much, much lower then if you have a really bad diet and you are deficient in vitamin K2 and vitamin D in your childhood. Moreover, I showed you that young bone uh, tissue is very, very active. Only osteocalcin levels are up to 10 times higher as compared to adults. 
That's why vitamin K requirements are also higher for children than for adults. And very often vitamin K2 is used only for osteoporosis and nobody remembers that children are very important and we need to take care of their bones too. So uh, I told you that we've got a problem with the intake, but we also need to remember that we change our um, food habits over the time. And there are many studies published actually in, in Europe which show that the consumption of vitamin K decreased gradually since 1950 in both genders, in girls and in boys. So we know that the children eat less vitamin K2 than it used to be, but does it correlate with the bone health? And uh, I think this graph is very convincing because it showed that over time there is increased rate of the fractures in the children. And it was confirmed by many, many scientists in different countries. It was done in Europe, in, in Scandinavia, as well in the US, that, um, the, um, that the, there is increased number of fractures in different places in children of both genders. We've got many studies which prove that vitamin K status is very important for healthy bones in children. The studies were published from 2004 until now, and they prove that um, in vitamin K status can be associated with higher bone mass and less, um, and uh, that, that vitamin K status was associated with higher bone mass and a lower level of inactive osteocalcin. So uh, the improvement in vitamin K status over time is related to lower bone turnover and subsequently additional increase in bone mineral content. There are two studies which I would like to mention at, at the end of my presentation. Both of them were done in collaboration, were done by Natopharma to some extent. MenaQ7 was provided for the study. Um, the first one is VITAC study, which was done and published in 2009 by Summeron Group. It was randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study, which enrolled 60 children, both genders, the same equal numbers. The children were supplemented with 45 micrograms, so it's very, very low dose of vitamin K2, for eight weeks. At the end and at the beginning, the children were, um, the blood was drawn and uh, the level of undercarboxylated and carboxylated osteocalcin was measured. So the um, evaluation I will show on a graph which is represented by UCR, which is ratio of undercarboxylated osteocalcin and carboxylated osteocalcin, and it's really good marker of vitamin K status. So when the scientists collected the results, they found no changes in a group, <coughs> in, a Sorry. in a placebo group, which was expected. However, in a group which was treated with MenaQ7, it was decreased in UCR significantly. And it was found even after eight weeks of supplementation with such a low dose. So, we, uh, it's nice to show that the biomarkers are changed by vitamin K2 supplementation, but do we have any proof that vitamin K supplementation can really improve bone in children's health? So far, we've got only one pilot study done by a Turkish group. The study was done on, 12, on 20 children, 12 girls and 8 boys. The children um, had thalassemic osteopathy and they were supplemented over one year with vitamin K2 and vitamin D3. The, during different time points at the baseline, after six months and after one year, the um, blood was collected, uh, the level of undercarboxylated osteocalcin was evaluated, and uh, measurements for bone mineral de density was taken. So what's the most important, after six months and after one year, the results detected a significant improvement in bone mineral density and Z-score at the lumbar spine of these patients. So it's really nice data because we don't have many, many data on a clinical trial uh, on, a, uh, on a children. It's very difficult to convince doctor 
to switch to vitamin K2, at least in Poland. So do we have any other diseases which can, uh, when children can benefit from vitamin K supplementation? And my opinion is yes, I think that the children with malabsorption of fat and fat soluble vitamins should benefit a lot. In the same case, children with cystic fibrosis, they've got a very weak bones, very often they supplemented with K1. However, I think that uh, vitamin K2 will be much, much beneficial for those children. So at the end, I would like to conclude that children showed the largest specific vitamin K deficiency, that NK7 is able to improve vitamin K status. It was shown by UCR, so activation of osteocalcin. Moreover, everyone I will ask about the dosage. So the effective dosage which was used in healthy children was only 45 micrograms of MenaQ7. In the case of the children with thalassemic osteopathy, it was 50 micrograms per children. And uh, it, in this study with thalassemic osteopathy, MK7 improved bone mineral density in these children. And the last point, which is really important, uh, that vitamin K2 is safe uh, for children, and it was proved not only in clinical studies by but in children, but also in adults. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Moraes. Any questions? Okay. Thank you so much. I, I get asked this question, so I'm going to ask you. So what age do you start supplementing, and what if they don't want to take a pill? Uh, I'm not sure how it's in the US. You know, I think that even nursing moms should be supplemented, and pregnant women should be supplemented, and we need a supplementation for a small children. Uh, I'm a mom of nine years old, active boy, and I cannot buy it in Poland so far, so I hope that the supplement company will move faster, you know, and they can bring good products for, for our children. But uh, I think that in all ages, uh, according to the data about deficiency and about diet, children all ages should be supplemented. Unless you can convince them that they eat natto or collect in the toilet something as Leon suggested, but yeah. I, I don't know, sometimes I think kids might really uh, go for that option, so hopefully not. Uh, very interesting, but uh, I may, uh, miss your the number. I'm just wondering how low it's now for the uh, K2 deficiency for the kids, different ages. Do you have the number, how to measure them? So it, it will be nice to have a like a numbers uh, for the specific groups of children. The recent study published in 2013 showed only children, one group was below 10 years old and the second group was between 10, year, 10 years old and 19 and they've got the same level of deficiency. It drops when you are 20 years old. Any additional questions, comments? Okay, well, Dr. Merez, thank you so much. Thank you to our other panelists as well, Dr. Reed, Dr. Sugars, Dr. Goodman. And thank you to all of you for joining us for our Vitamin K2 workshop. Um, again, thank you for attending the 19th Supply Side West, and we will see you back here in Las Vegas October 4th to the 8th, uh, 2016. Thank you.